if we take a number of revolutionary changes introduced by the French Revolution. Um, I think you know that we are running at the end of that cycle. And I would start with the, uh, the, the military model, which has been, you know, mobilizing the entire population of a nation, because France was in circle at the time, and the only way to resist was to really mobilize everybody, and that was the mass armies uh, based on conscription. That is gone. We have reverted back to the system of uh, specialists. At that time, they were professional soldiers. Today, it's professional soldiers. Because, you know, we did not need these mass armies. Uh, they were based on industrial production and so on and so forth. And even France, if France, which has introduced the system, has abandoned the system now. So this is, uh, I, I would say, you know, an indication that that cycle is over. If you take parties, for instance, right, more or less it's the same. Today uh, you belong to something else rather than a party in traditional form. You do not have the cohesion provided you know, by the same position towards wealth of a large number of people, many people mixed up. So uh, if you take, for instance, the, the kind of style in debate uh, which has been shown, you know, by the recent uh, American uh, electoral process, you will see that many things come to an end. Uh, the problem is, you know, that if you take this uh, system of uh, those who are employed are working uh, for those who have been working before, and now they have to cash in uh, their pensions and so on and so forth. Again, you know, we we move to the end. Uh, the social contract. The state is providing less and less and is demanding more and more. Uh, all of that, you know, I think is approaching some sort of an end. And uh, we have not found a solid replacement of that. And that's why, you know, we are, we are approaching uh, the uh, cliff we have to jump. We don't want, we do not know what's there, how high it is. And this is, I would try to describe, you know, the current uh, situation. So perhaps, you know, we should, uh, we should reflect a little bit more to the end of these cycles uh, in this respect. But because we uh, decided with Mr. President that I would uh, try to we move on now to the last uh, part. Uh, to conclude our panel, yes, I agree, you know, it's, it's neither a panacea nor completely a mirage. Um, because, you know, we cannot solve everything with uh, this. After all, politics is not only, uh, I would say, very objective, but it's also a question of art, intuition. It's also a question of experience and intuition based on experience. You've been before there, you saw the relative situation, so, so more or less it goes along those lines and you would be prepared, you know, to, to act in those lines. So uh, it's neither nor. Uh, or, so this is my personal opinion in this respect. Um, I would say, for instance, you said the, the, the scientist is going for certainty while, you know, the politician would prefer ambiguity. I would say, you know, that the uh, scientist uh, or the academic has always uh, have the advantage of having many options. Uh, if it holds water, it's valid, uh, while the politician has only one option. And if it's not the right one when he makes it, consequences are there. So I think, you know, that, that the range of options for the politicians are more limited. Uh, ambiguity, so we have to translate this. Um, we said, you know, that the current crisis confronting the European Union is to be solved through more Europe and not less Europe. This has been the mantra Mr. Barroso every time said so. And I don't think, you know, that actually it changed. 
The problem is, you know, that uh, this more Europe is providing by the less European body from our construction, which is the council, which is more or less the country sitting around the table. So, so you see, it's, it's not the commission, it's not the parliament, which have been strengthened by this uh, philosophy of more Europe, but rather the council. And here it is, you know, the council does not need uh, sort of a European uh, briefing, European policy based on evidence or something. The council has its own national national uh, uh, people who have prepared, you know, their papers, and they have to defend the national interest in the battle with others. So that's why, you know, maybe, maybe this is one of the reasons why the council is so uh, is so less connected to uh, to this sort of you know policy which which we we have. I would have also uh, I would make a distinction. I think everybody is doing it between the academic and between the interest groups, who are also providing information. But that's biased information, more or less because they would like to have a certain outcome in that respect, while the academic is more or less neutral in this respect. Uh, so, so there is a certain uh, distinction between the two. Now, both of us, the parliamentarians, the politicians, and you, and you in social sciences and political sciences, have one, uh, one I would say, credential which is our relationship with the public. Because we are, we are responsible to the public, and we have to have our own contact, because we are accountable to them. And we appeal to you because you tell us better what the public wants. And this is, or at least this is the expectation. Or at least this is the expectation. So more or less, you know, that's why we, we ask for the advice. Because you can tell me more then I can find out, and I would need in order to relate to the public. Um, then uh, I would say also that uh, we have to take into account this uh, reality that, um, and we should be aware of that. I'm speaking now as a sort of also an academic rather than a politician. Um, that there are pseudo-specialists, people who pretend, you know, that they are uh, good at it and uh, they also appear and they influence the public. Uh, so I think, you know, that we should also be aware of that because, after all, it's our status in the game uh, here. And um, let's not forget the distortions of the messages, the politicians send messages to the public and expect the public to react in a certain way. You help us, you know, with telling us what is the pulse and with this data and everything which you provide and research and everything. But at the same time, the entire process can be distorted by uh, confusion intentionally because this is the aim of hybrid war. And look what is happening now in, in the United States, for instance. Uh, how much, you know, the messages are being, uh, um, are being uh, uh, distorted uh, through false information or through other means. How much, you know, the, there is a tendency to move the decisions of the people in the emotional area. Uh, I personally, you know, coming from a country which has always uh, is inclined to look at something, you know, as, as something uh, behind the scenes and everything, I would suspect, you know, the, my first reaction when I read that uh, Mr. Trump has had to be removed by the Secret Service to protect him and so on, is as a stage thing. Who knows, you know, who that guy is who said the weapon or whatever, and then you knew he immediately jumped in front of television. And then the entire country is emotional. Oh, poor guy, you know, so maybe he deserves to become a president because of that. So this sort of thing, 
this sort of thing. When, you know, so uh, emotions, emotions are exactly interfering with the cold-blooded decision-making. So you cannot do that, you, you do, or a decision on the moment. This morning, you know, something has happened and I'm voting this way. Do you regret it afterwards, as it happened in Britain? Gone, gone. I do not know, I do not think personally that the Brexiteers wanted to win. They wanted a good run. And all of a sudden they saw that God's implemented to the fullest their, uh, their wish. So with all of that, you know, I say, I stayed with you. I participated here as if I was invited as a participant. I'm very glad that I did that. Uh, I do not usually, the seminars and everything in which I participate are more on the security side, military things, uh, this sort of thing, uh, rather than, you know, this, uh, your, your seminar today. But uh, I, I have to confess, you know, that I don't regret it. So thank you very much. And now to the president for the final conclusions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I'm aware that uh, you've had a long day of discussions uh, and that it's getting very late, so uh, I myself will be very brief. Um, but I can't resist the temptation to react to some of the things I heard. Uh, um, you have to understand that, uh, like anything European, this institution, the European University Institute, is a complex institution uh, because it is basically the fruit of an ambiguous compromise uh, between uh, a variety of actors. So as you know, it's, it's an institution of higher education, but in, in today's world it means it, it must be active in the world of research as well. Uh, and it's also expected that somehow what it does will be of some relevant to people who are active on the policy making front. So uh, all this makes for a, a rather ambiguous uh, and complex mandate, but uh, it's of course uh, the situation many uh, institutions of higher education find themselves in. I mean, after all, you pointed out, uh, Mr. President, that uh, we uh, all, in a way, have to think of uh, our relationship to our public. Now, in the case of an elected uh, member of parliament, this is a complex relationship, but it has simple uh, dimensions in the sense that you know that uh, uh, you have a mandate and somehow you can be made accountable uh, to your voters for that mandate. In the case of a European academic institution, it's a bit more complex. Uh, we don't know who exactly are our constituents. Uh, because, in a way, uh, we are operating... European uh, citizens. Yes, exactly. Uh, who are they? Uh, uh, and do they know they are European citizens? We know that very many of them do know. Um, so it, it makes for a, a, a Maybe rather... Maybe they do, others do not know. <laughs> some do, some who do. Who would have to recognize So the only way uh, for us uh, to, let's say, meet these various challenges and to engage into a systematic dialogue with uh, a number of uh, stakeholders and, uh, of course, uh, uh, not only is the European Parliament uh, a very important stakeholder. It's also the stakeholder with which we have engaged into uh, the most systematic uh, structural dialogue, which I'm very happy of, uh, thanks to this uh, uh, policy dialogue in which this uh, today's session uh, uh, finds uh, its own role. We need that kind of regular interaction. We need that kind of ad hoc instruments to uh, precisely develop progressively a culture of, uh, of discussion and cooperation. I, for one, happen to believe it is in the interest of both sides. It's not merely that we have to uh, address the needs of uh, important constituents, but as uh, 
uh, being myself uh, a scholar interested in public policy, I always found it interesting to look at what people on the other side of the fence, so to say, uh, may, uh, may be thinking, the way they operate, uh, and the way they react to uh, some problems that one see em emerging. So uh, opportunities like uh, this one are important for us also to, uh, let's say, refine our analyses of uh, uh, the way public uh, policy is made. Now, in that kind of two-way relationship, uh, well, there are a number of traps uh, of which we are to be aware. It's easy to, it's easy for academics uh, n not to be sufficiently aware of what's going on on the other side of the fence and to let's say, uh, insufficiently appreciate uh, that uh, people on that side have, uh, well, to, to address concerns which academics do not have normally address, such as precisely political concerns, uh, because it, it's part of your job uh, to, to respond to uh, uh, divergences of interest and, and to, to find the, the best way to articulate them. Now, I must say that, having attended the second part of this afternoon, I think uh, the least one can say is that one uh, has not fallen into this kind of trap, because uh, I did not hear the kind of militant discourse that one may hear when, not least, you talk about the reform of public policy. That is to say, we have the right solution, and why don't you follow uh, the, the wise advice that, uh, that we may provide to you? On the contrary, I've seen perhaps even uh, a greater uh, caveat uh, and greater fears on the sides of uh, my colleague academics uh, than uh, what one would expect in that kind of exercise, which I think is the way it ought to be. Our role is not to uh, basically uh, uh, provide anybody with a lecture uh, into any topic, but rather to present, uh, uh, let's say, interesting innovations, but also to, to help problematize uh, uh, the, the way uh, things uh, are being done and uh, suggest that uh, there may be sites that are not necessarily receiving the attention uh, uh, that they deserve. So in that re respect, I found it a most interesting exercise. I hope it was the case of all participants in uh, this round table and uh, that despite the, the late how uh, you came to, uh, uh, let's say, appreciate uh, that this exercise was useful in, uh, let's say, your, your daily work. Uh, uh, certainly uh, confirm that we are committed to carrying on that uh, kind of uh, uh, discussion on a regular basis because I repeat I think it is in the interest of both sides so uh, let's meet uh, uh, let's meet in uh, the near future to discuss more topics uh, and, and come up with uh, more problematized uh, views on uh, uh, topics of joint interest. That's the only uh, conclusion I draw from uh, to today's work, and uh, I wish you a pleasant end of stay in Florence. Thank, Thank you. you very much.